Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Annapolis for the 2024 Naval Academy Leadership Conference. For those of you I didn't get the chance to meet yesterday, my name is Midshipman First Class Julia Christie, and I have the pleasure of being the chair of this year's conference. The opportunity to listen to leaders in a variety of fields, to hear their experiences and their lessons learned, and then to take what we've learned and apply it to our own sphere of influence is a privilege. Our conference theme this year is learning to lead the lifelong pursuit of service, and our goal as a conference staff is to create an experience that produces a ripple effect of growth and selfless service. We're here to develop ourselves as leaders and as learners. That's the core purpose of this conference and this institution. The more we grow ourselves, though, the stronger our obligation is to share what we've learned with the people that we're leading with and the people below us. So, throughout the next few days, I urge you to take notes, listen with intent, and absorb as much as possible so that you can bring what you've learned back to your own sphere of influence and help your people grow a little bit as well. Before we begin with our speaker lineup for today, I'd like to introduce you all to our Commandant to offer some remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel J.P. McDonough III, United States Marine Corps, Commandant of Midshipmen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the United States Naval Academy Leadership Conference. On behalf of the Superintendent, Vice Admiral Davids, welcome to Annapolis on a beautiful snowy day. So everybody, good morning. That was pretty weak. Let's try this again. Good morning. Okay. So it's going to be an exciting couple days. It's going to be interactive. This is going to be an opportunity to you, for you to learn from each other. So before we start, I want to offer a welcome to some special guests. So we have 32 international delegates from 15 countries. I'm going to have them go ahead and identify themselves. Raise your hand when I call it your country. Brazil. All right. Chile. All right. Denmark. France, Georgia, Germany, Italy, there we go, Japan, Peru, Poland, I saw them earlier, Republic of China, got it, Romania, all right, the UK, I saw them just walk in, and finally Ukraine. Everybody give them a warm welcome to the United States. As we know, in the United States military, we do nothing alone, and our partners um, in training and education and on the battlefield are absolutely essential to our success. So it's very special to have them with us here today. Additionally, we have cadets from all the other service academies and several senior military colleges as well as several hundred delegates from various universities, colleges, organizations from across the United States. Welcome to all. All right, so just look, get a little fun. Who's from the West Coast? Where are we at? All right, so that is snow, in case you don't know. We, brought, we had special, just, actually the folks from Colorado Springs brought it down with them for us today. What about East Coast? Everyone, who's from the, this side of the country? All right, what about the Midwest? We got some out there, I know. All right, we got somebody here from Hawaii. Anyone? I think I saw that. Someone from Hawaii. So that, so that might be the first time they've seen snow. So bringing everyone together from across the country is important. You know, and none of, none of us have the, the market cornered on leadership. And I, and I can tell you, every interaction that, that you will have today in this next couple days, you should look at it as a learning experience. So as you're here at the conference, enjoy all that the Naval Academy has to offer in the city of Annapolis. Um, get to see the beauty, you get to see again Annapolis in the snow. For us, this is actually the first time I've seen this since I've been here almost three years. And I think there's, it's a great opportunity to see, uh, walk out into downtown Annapolis. I know for our friends at West Point and Air Force, the unique opportunity to be able to walk to Liberty is, is something that they don't normally get to experience. Hopefully enjoy that. I do have one special shout out to, there's a Hokie out there whose dad is a good friend of mine, uh, a fellow artilleryman. So I wanted to say hello and slightly embarrass that Hokie, but I won't give the name. So welcome. All right, the Naval Academy is a special place, and I am so glad you get to spend a few days with us here. For those who get to dine in King Hall, I think you'll enjoy your lunch, where you get to hang out with, you know, the 4,400 members of the brigade, everyone eating at lunch. It's a bit of a cacophony, uh, but it's an amazing opportunity. Also tonight, we'll have a four-star lecture with Admiral Colin Green, the Deputy Commandant, or excuse me, Deputy Commander of SOCOM. 
So one little piece of advice, and this is we've seen uh, when we do our forestall lectures in the past, you will see midshipmen at the end get up and ask a question. And they'll identify themselves. I'm, they'll say, I'm midshipman, first class, McDonough from third company. And everyone will cheer. So when you stand up, and I encourage all of you, if you want to ask a question, please do that. You have to identify yourself. So think about what you're going to say beforehand. And don't be afraid when the brigade shouts and, and, and cheers you on and asking your great questions. So just be ready. This isn't your normal lecture at a, at a, you know, a normal university. A little bit, little more, bit more energy. So as, as she said, um, I am Colonel J.P. McDonough, the Commandant of Midshipmen here at the Naval Academy. So I'm the equivalent of the Dean of Students uh, at a civilian university, but it's kind of on steroids. My responsibility is a little greater than I would say many of my peers at other universities. In this role, I interact with midshipmen every day as they navigate their four-year journey at the Naval Academy. It offers all the rigors of academia, so no matter what your your major is, everyone graduates with a Bachelor of Science, takes three semesters of Calc, uh, regardless of being English, History, Foreign Area Studies. We have 30, 36 varsity sports, but I will say even if you're not a, a varsity athlete, every member of the Brigade and Midshipmen is a combat athlete, as well as the daily challenges of a regimental military lifestyle. For those who woke up in Bancroft Hall this morning and you heard chow calls, you probably wondered what was going on. That's the daily occurrence, life of a midshipman. The mission of the Naval Academy is to develop midshipmen morally, mentally, and physically. As the Commandant, my focus is on the moral mission, specifically ensuring every midshipman who graduate and earns their commission in the Navy or the Marine Corps is ready to lead sailors and Marines on day one. There are many aspects of moral and ethical leadership that are required to be successful in the fleet and in life. During this conference, you will hear from outstanding leaders, both in uniform and out, who will share their experience of learning to lead. I'm excited to hear and personally learn from each of them. The theme of this conference is near and dear to my heart, learning to lead the lifelong pursuit of service. So I don't know if I'm the oldest guy in the room. I look around and see some of, some of my peers, but probably pretty close. And so for the last 34 years, starting here in, in 1990 as a plebe, I have worked to better myself. Now, I can't say that every day. I, that would be a little disingenuous to say that every day I've worked to better myself. But as a Marine officer, I have felt the need as a leader to constantly be improving, to try and never let my sailors and Marines down. And if I did, which I did, to learn from those mistakes. So let me share with you three lessons that I have learned throughout my career that may help you along your journey of becoming the best leader you can be. And none of these are original, but they are things that when I think about a conference like this, and I think about the opportunity to learn from each other, but if someone asked me, what are something you, I could tell you that hopefully would make you a better leader? This, these are the things I thought about. First, leaders are readers. If you're a midshipman at the Naval Academy, hopefully by now you've figured out how important I believe reading is to personal development. Every break, whether summer or winter, midshipmen are... I tell them to read books, and I don't tell them necessarily which books, I give them some suggestions, but I am trying to create lifelong learners. This is an original idea by me, by any, any stretch. In Call Sign Chaos, General Mattis says, if you haven't read hundreds of books, you are functionally illiterate, and you will be incompetent, because your personal experiences alone aren't broad enough to sustain you. So as, as we know, Secretary Mattis, General Mattis, is never one to mince words. That's a pretty harsh statement, but nevertheless true. General Mattis highlights the key point that through reading, we can add to our experience and our knowledge base. Perhaps you've read the book Ender's Game or seen the movie, which uses simulation and training to build experience. That's a topic probably for another conference, but the idea of building experience through reading, through listening, through understanding is essential as a leader. So what are you reading? This is a question I often get asked, and my answer is usually a little convoluted. And it usually goes along like, well, I'm listening to Stephen King or Tom Clancy. I have a hard copy of My Helmet as a Pillow about Marines in the Pacific or another historical, historical piece. And I'm listening to Build, Your, Build the Life You Want by Arthur Brooks and Oprah. And I don't say that to brag, wow, he's, look at how impressive he likes to read. I, I say that for you all that there are so many ways to consume good information these days, right? 
physically, I can be listening while I work out, which is, is a lot of often what I do, or commuting for those who, who make long commutes. It's amazing how much you can commute going to and from the Pentagon for years and years and years. Um, the, you know, and it, what can you read? You should be learning from everything, from fiction, from history, from leadership. And I'll use a word so my peers here, metacognition, understanding how you think. And that doesn't just say, like I said, it has to be a book. Professional articles, podcasts, TED Talks. There's always something good to consume. Which brings me to my next point. What are your daily habits? If you look at your daily schedule from the time, like when you wake up, your morning routine, how you build and track your schedule, and what you do at the end of the day, ask yourself, do I have good habits? How much time do I scroll? consuming the wrong stuff, which, we're all, which we all do, and I will put myself, spend a little bit of time on Instagram and Facebook. Ask yourself, how many pages of a book could I consume in that same amount of time? I can say, in just the last two years, I have adjusted my daily schedule based on my reading. Any guesses what books I read? Anybody? Interactive portion? Go ahead. Got one, Atomic Addicts, two other books. Anybody guess? In the back. Leaders Eat Last, great book. No, that's a, but that's one. What, uh, what other books? One more. Anybody. Boys in a Boat, great book. So the other two books that I read were Discipline is Destiny by Ryan Holiday, who we have come and speak to us pretty frequently, and The 5 a.m. Club by Robin Sharma. So when I read those three books, in the last one, I, I, in that order, actually, I realized that I can be better. And this is me as a, you know, 50-plus-year-old guy, Marine, that I can be more disciplined in my schedule. And so I changed what I did. Anybody know, according to the current research, how long it takes to have a habit become something that you do without thinking about it? How many, how many days? Anybody? 66 is at least based off of both Atomic Habits and 5 a.m. Club is about that time. So a little over two months. So I'll be honest with you, that, that's a long time. That's longer than plebe summer for the midshipmen here. Uh, but I can tell you personally, and I wasn't perfect, and, and you know, if you read those books, it doesn't talk about perfection, but it's, it's if you have a day, you get back on the horse and you keep going. Um, but I can tell you that the morning routine that I have built, including listening to a spiritual podcast, reading or listening to Daily Stoic, and working out, and some writing, has made every day better. Why? Because no matter how my day goes, at least I fed my spirit and got my sweat on, right? And whether that's in the Pentagon or whether it's here, you can't always control your schedule. But if you can control that part of the day and you feed your body, feed your mind, feed your soul, it will set you up for success. Last thought, thought for you this morning about learning to lead. Again, not a new thought. But to be honest, not something I've always seen practiced by leaders is humility, which will be the subject of our first panel this morning. What, anybody tell me, what is the entry argument for being a good learner? Somebody. What do you have to do to be a good learner? Go ahead. Okay. Everybody, he said, knowing that you know nothing. And, and so that, that's exactly right. Will, being willing to learn. And admitting that you don't know everything. And, you know, as an, I was a former instructor at the basic school where all Marine second lieutenants go. And we were always talking about not learning that you don't know what you don't know. And I've found in my career, you know, over my time, that I've dealt with leaders who, who didn't always act like that. They, never, they didn't always feel like they had something to learn. Um, if you treat every engagement with people you meet as an opportunity to learn, whether it's from, in my case, from the most junior Marine, a brand new Marine, or it's an elderly World War II veteran, you will grow every day. It's that mindset of being willing to learn. How else do I learn? By asking for and accepting feedback. And when appropriate, admitting mistakes and making changes. I can tell you as a leader, this, this is a challenge. But it is a challenge, that idea of accepting feedback and being willing to listen to others is absolutely critical to being a successful leader. It's absolutely critical to growing an organization. 
And I'll be honest, as the commandant of midshipmen, I get a lot of feedback from all sides. It's amazing how much everyone wants to help me do a better job. From the most junior plebe to parents, to my peers, my boss, of course, and then, of course, there's a bunch of alumni who can tell me how it used to be here and, and how I should change things. Uh, it takes a lot of humility and desire to be better, not just for yourself, but for those you lead to be open to feedback. One benefit of being a humble leader and open to feedback is building trust with your people. Trust is the true currency of leadership and is essential to success. So everyone who is here in the audience, you have passed the first test of learning to lead. You are here and ready to learn. So everyone give yourself a round of applause this morning for being here. <clears throat> As you go through this conference, here's my advice to you. Ask people what they're reading. Ask them what habits that they make them successful. And finally, ask them what is the most impactful feedback they've received. When did someone tell them what they needed to hear, not what they wanted to hear? My last task to all of you is make the point to meet as many people as you can. The connections you make here could become lifelong colleagues as you continue your studies and leader development. The focus groups that you all experience should be the most impactful time where you get to have further conversations about what people will talk. You're going to talk about different things. Make those connections. That learning, that personal relationship, eye to eyeball to eyeball, is truly the most important thing. Why well, we're glad we're all here in person. So I'll, I'll go ahead and stop for a second there, and I'll open up the questions. Because I've done this, this talk the last couple of years, and I've found actually a lot of the questions from those outside of the Naval Academy have been some of the most insightful. So we got microphones up front. So if anyone who some courage and wants to jump up and ask a question about anything, here at the Naval Academy or anything that I talked about, anyone want to ask me what book I read, I can, I can do that. Anybody, any questions? Anybody? Oh, here we go. Hi, sir. I'm, um, my name is Derek. I'm from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Go Huskers. There you go. Um, growth requires energy. Um, Low energy learning is not efficient learning. Energy is not recharged by getting a full night's rest, in my opinion. You gotta do other things. What is your opinion on recharging your energy and how you handle burnout? Okay, so uh, good question. So I mentioned the 5 a.m. club. You know, by the title, you can guess that means getting up at 5 a.m. Um, and some of us are early risers and some of, it, some of us aren't. Here's what I'll say. There's also a lot of studies that talk about the importance of sleep. You know, and here at the Naval Academy, if you would ask the average midshipman, they probably don't get as much sleep as they would like. Uh, but here, so here's what I would say. You absolutely need to recharge your batteries, you know, on weekends or whenever it is. And you need to listen to your body because if you're, if you're not strong physically, uh, it makes it hard to be strong mentally and morally. So here, I guess I would say is you need to develop the discipline to do things you don't always want to do. A great, another great book, Do Hard Things by Steve Magnus talks about that. But you also need to be able to listen to your body. So for example, I don't like getting up at 5 a.m., but that's the routine that I've developed and I've, and I've realized that you can become used to difficult things. Now we, in the, here at the Naval Academy, the plebes learned very earlier, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. So I, to my point is, I think a certain amount of discomfort and doing things you don't like make us better persons, people, and it prepares us for hard times. Um, on the, but I would say also, sometimes you, there is, you need downtime, you need to listen to your body. But in general, I would say pursuing things that make you harder, more res resilient is definitely the way to go. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Go Huskers. Admiral Carter there, former superintendent, now taking care of Nebraska. Go ahead. Uh, sir, my name is a Cadet, D Cadet Nicholas Hall from Army ROTC, Siena College. I kind of had a very similar question to uh, him over there, um, but I, I would say I would going to adjust it a little bit. Okay. Um, when you, when that alarm goes off, 5 a.m., especially days where you know you don't have to wake up, nobody's going to be calling you that, nobody's going to be calling you to hold you accountable for not going to the gym that morning, maybe, that you know you don't have to. Um, what's that first thing you say to yourself when that alarm goes off? What's that first thought that comes to your head that gets you out of bed, that gets you to, uh, you know, 
actually go through with it? And um, how much freedom do you say, how much time does that, does that open up for yourself to actually be able to keep that habit, wake okay. up that early? Okay, great, great question. So I'll say the first thing, I, so one, I, and I talk a lot about having an accountability partner. So I normally do work out by myself or I'll work out with my wife, who is my accountability partner in the midst, I've talked about that often. Having somebody that you're accountable to, who may not be the person there, but who will call you out, hey, did you work out today? No, and, the, and they'll, they'll let you know that you, didn't, you were weak or you didn't do what you needed to. Having somebody who does that because they, lo they, they love you, they care for you, is important. Um, I also, why do I do it? I do it for my own personal growth, but to be honest, I do it for this group here. I do it for the midshipmen because I know I need to set the example. And I mentioned that earlier about the things I do, you do for your people, for your, in my case, my Marines, my sailors, my midshipmen. So I think you have to, what's my why? And I think, which is another topic for the conference, is why am I doing this? If I'm doing this because I want to look good and everything else, then you're not doing it for the right reason. Am I doing it because it's the best thing for me personally? Am I doing this because it's the best thing as a leader? I'm setting the example. And also, I have an, having an accountability partner is important. So I think finding somebody who will call you out uh, is important. And again, not because they, don't, they want to make fun of you, but because they want you to be better at yourself. So I think that's super important. Uh, well, I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question again? Um, when, by keeping that habit and actually being able to you know, accomplish that. Yeah, how much like, time? Yeah, so you're, yeah. you're spot you on. Are? So it does give me the time. And what's it give me the time to do? To be honest, it gives me the quiet time in the morning before the craziness to reflect and think. And, and in the busy world that we all have, I mean, people have ear pods in half of their life. Having that time to think and reflect is truly, I'll be honest, it's kind of changed how I view the world. And I'll, I'll say it makes me a better leader. So just even a few minutes of quietness in the morning is, is critical. So thank you. Great question. Yes, thank you, sir. All right, last question. Go ahead. Good morning, Colonel. <clears throat> uh, first class, Ryan Lau from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. Uh, you spoke that it takes about 66 days to build a good habit. How long would you say it's taken you to break your bad habits, and what techniques did you use to do that? Yeah, that's a good question. So I would also recommend Atomic Habits. It, it gets into that. Um, I, you know, talk about, I think for me, the, the realization of bad habits is trying to understand the impact they have on you and others, and, and realizing that you you know, the idea of quitting cold turkey or whatever it is, isn't necessarily realistic. And I think it's the same thing as far as starting new habits. You're not going to be perfect. And the same thing goes with breaking bad habits. But I think if you, st if you realize the why and you realize that if you keep working at it, you'll eventually get there, I think that's important. I guess you need to give yourself some grace, right? That's a, you know, that's a term that you don't hear often thrown out. Uh, but you have to give yourself some grace to not be perfect and realize the why do I, and to keep pushing on that. And again, I'll echo what I said before, having somebody who knows what you're trying to do and will help you get there, I think is really important. You know, and that requires some level of vulnerability to somebody that you admit that I have a bad habit and I'm trying to break it. So I think that level of having somebody help you, but also giving yourself some grace is really important. So yeah, that, that's a great question. And I think sometimes we all struggle with that of, one, acknowledging we have bad habits, and two, realizing that it's hard. So great question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, so before we, we bring on our first speaker, I just want to say a few things. First of all, I want to say thank you to Julia Christie, Sean Harlan, the entire team who set this up. So everybody, please give them a round of applause. So we also have Lieutenant Commander Tim Bergstrom and Lieutenant Erica Leonhardt, who I don't know if they're in the audience, we're probably running around doing it, but they have been the mentors to help our midshipmen through this. So special thanks to them as well. Uh, bef so before we bring our first speaker up, who's going to be introduced by midshipman uh, by Aubin Hattendorf, I think I got that right, there we go. Uh, so uh, Admiral Winnefeld, who's going to be our first speaker this morning, um, I actually worked for him when he was the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I was a, I was a lowly uh, Lieutenant Colonel, had just my first time on the Joint Staff, but I got the opportunity to work with a very amazing team. And we worked on some of the most challenging problems that the country faced. And what I saw, what I learned in that, that period of time uh, working for the vice chairman was how individuals can make a difference. 
And that, that's, that seems obvious, but when you're working in a very small group of highly technical, highly talented folks, but you work for an amazing leader, who in this case happened to be a four-star admiral, but yet your input, my input as a lieutenant colonel new to the job, made a difference, it empowered the team. I felt I was part of a special team. And there was no amount of time, there was no amount of effort that I wasn't willing to put in to, to go after these hard problems. So when you listen to Admiral Winnefeld talk today, I can tell you from my own personal experience, when he talks about building great teams, I had the honor of serving on one of those for a short period of time, but it was truly amazing. So I'll let um, Alvin come up here and introduce him, but I just want to say I'm excited to hear him speak it today and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Midshipman First Class Aubin Hattendorf, and it's my honor to introduce our first keynote address, Admiral James Winnefeld. Admiral Winnefeld graduated from the Georgia Institute of Technology with a degree in aerospace engineering and served for 37 years in the United States Navy. He instructed Top Gun and served as a senior aide-de-camp to General Colin L. Powell. He commanded a fighter squadron, the amphibious ship, the USS Cleveland, and the aircraft carrier, the USS Enterprise. As a flag officer, he commanded a carrier strike group, two NATO commands, the US Sixth Fleet and US Northern Command, and the US North American Aerospace Defense Command. He retired in 2015 after serving as the ninth vice chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staffs. Admiral Winnefeld is a frequently published author and a director of advisory board member for several companies operating in a broad spectrum of business sectors. He is a distinguished professor at the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs at Georgia Tech, where he is also a member of the Engineering Hall of Fame. He's a senior non-resident fellow at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, John F. Kennedy School of Government, and Harvard University. Admiral Winnefeld and his wife, Mary, co-founded the SAFE Project, a national nonprofit committee to help reverse the epidemic of drug overdose fatalities in the United States. He is also the co-host of the podcast, The Adrenaline Zone. Sir, thank you for taking the time to come speak today. Please join me in welcoming Admiral Winnefeld. Thank you very much. Well done. Appreciate it. All right. First question. Is this thing working? Yes. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. It's really great uh, to be with you. It was really fun driving over here from Washington, D.C. this morning. I can tell you that. Hour and a half in traffic, but well worth it. Uh, what an amazing group. I've watched this um, event evolve over the years, and, and boy, it's really come a long way, and it's it's such a delight to see people from all over, not only uh, the Naval Academy, other service academies, ROTC, and our civilian friends from across the country. Uh, thank you for spending the time to be here to learn about something that will hopefully profoundly affect you for the rest of your life. Um, <clears throat> I will uh, say that, um, in deference to the Commandant, uh, my father was the Commandant of Midshipmen uh, back in when dinosaurs were on the Earth in, uh, in 1980. Uh, and I was a student at Georgia Tech. You can understand why I didn't come to the Naval Academy because I didn't want to be here when my dad was the commandant. But uh, I recall him telling me at the time that being the commandant of midshipmen, and I would suspect you know, commandant of cadets at West Point and at Air Force Academy and elsewhere, is the number one leadership job in the Navy and Marine Corps because you are directly responsible, even more so than the superintendent, uh, for training young men and women to be leaders. And I never forgot that. So what a, a wonderful privilege it is for me to be back here having the opportunity to talk to a group of amazing young people who are going to be our future leaders in our country. Now, um, I would say that uh, it, it's, it's very nice to be able to talk about leadership. Uh, I think uh, it's really important to understand why you have to have leaders, for one thing. Uh, leaders are required for uh, the ability, really three things, three major things. One is to build a great team. 
which I had on the joint staff, as the Commandant mentioned a minute ago, and he's absolutely correct. Uh, it was an amazing team. To give that team uh, culture and vision and get out of the way and let them do their work. Um, and then finally, to manage a crisis when it happens, because you often find as the leader of a large organization that you are really the person in the organization that is best equipped to handle that crisis or to at least lead the organization through it. And of course, leadership is, is largely about getting people to do things that they don't necessarily want to do and, and to do a really, really good job with it. Um, and you'd be uh, surprised, actually, to see how few businesses in this country actually think about training their leaders, training young leaders. The military services, certainly the military academies and, and ROTC, do a pretty good job of getting young people started down that leadership track. But you'd be very surprised, and very often, it's only later in a career when somebody is now going to be thrust into a leadership position that they're actually offered any kind of leadership training whatsoever. So you are fortunate in the institutions you come from that they believe in doing that at a very, very early age. Now, learning about leadership, and I'm talking about serious adult leadership here, um, is, is in one way sort of difficult for young people. I know it was hard for me in the following way, and that is when, when you were in high school, generally the people who were considered to be leaders were often the most athletic, the best looking, the most charismatic people around. And I can tell you that in my experience, as uh, growing up in my career as a leader, that I have met an awful lot of very athletic, charismatic, and good-looking people who actually turned out to be very lousy leaders, okay? So that is one of the first things that you, you sort of have to unlearn as a young leader, is that you may not be the most athletic, charismatic, or you know, super good-looking person, but you can very, very definitely become an awesome leader. Commandant referred to General Mattis earlier. I assure you that General Mattis is not the best looking man in the world, nor is he the best athlete. But he was a pretty damn good leader. So he's, a, he's exhibit A for me among a lot of other people, uh, both on the positive and the negative side of that, of that ledger. Um, <clears throat> I will tell you, though, that learning about leadership is, is not a soundbite. It's not reading a simple self-help book. It's not even about attending a conference. It is, again, as I think I overheard Commandant say, it is a lifelong journey of learning. Constant, constant learning. Uh, there, there just is no single soundbite. Now, you're, as you grow up as a leader, as you grow up in whatever uh, pathway you take, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, Army, civilian, you name it, Coast Guard, Space Force, uh, you're going to find that you run across really good leaders, and you're going to find that you run across some mediocre leaders and actually some very poor leaders. And that's going to teach you at least three things. One is that our institutions are not perfect at raising leaders. Uh, we can always do better. Another thing you'll learn is that you can learn from both the good leaders and the what I call other leaders. Um, you can learn from both of them. Jot down what works and what doesn't work and you'll be fine. And then the third thing that I often tell young people is don't get jaundiced about the fact that you may someday work for a leader who's not necessarily your ideal of the perfect leader. I, you know, I tell people that when you get to your first unit, whether it's a Marine Corps platoon or a Navy squadron ship or submarine or what have you, you're going to be all brand new, excited. Hey, I finally got here after all this academics and training and everything, and I'm ready to go, and it's going to be really, really special. And then after a couple of years, you're going to realize that whatever institution you're in has a lot of flaws. Not leaders who are not perfect, institutions that have bureaucracy and entropy and things like that. Don't get jaundiced by that. Don't look over the edge and say, you know, I'll bet it's better over there, because it's probably not. Every organization is going to have that. And the young people who can power through that and still continue learning about their institution, about their profession, and about leadership are the ones who are going to be the most successful. So that's the, the third, perhaps most important thing. Now, before you get serious about learning to be a leader, you have to ask yourself, a very, very important question, and that is, why do I want to become a good leader? 
If the answer to you is, well, because I want to become an admiral or a general or I want to get wealthy or I want to be a famous politician, then I would beg you to not start. Uh, don't go down that road. But if your answer is that I want to make a difference in the world in whatever it is that I do and I want to get really good at something, then let's go. Start that lifelong journey and become an excellent leader. And the second thing you have to ask yourself is whether you're willing to put in the work to do it. Because, like I said earlier, it's not about charisma or good looks or being an athlete or anything like that, although all those things can help certain leaders. It's about putting in the time to learn how to lead. Because it does not happen overnight. And every single one of you can become a, great, a good or a great leader, depending on how much time you put into it. And that really, you know, in terms of effort in any activity, whether it's learning to fly an airplane, or being a great nuclear power operator, or whatever, really sort of takes three things. And leadership is no exception. You have to have a little bit of innate talent. Um, you need to have a lot of motivation. You're willing to work very hard. And it really is important to find the best teachers that you can find. And I've always found, and particularly in my case, that you can make up for a shortcoming in one of those things if you're really good in the other two. And what I'm talking about is you may not be the most talented person, I wasn't the most talented person, to be honest with you, when I got out of high school and went to college and then got into the Navy. But I worked really hard and I found the best teachers I could find. So that's true about leadership. So gravitate towards really good leaders and learn as much as you can from them as you put in the work to learn how to do it yourself. Now, I would tell you that any time you want to learn about something, it's really good to have a really solid framework for hanging your knowledge on as you go down that lifelong journey of learning. And over my 37 years in the military, and even since then, I started to develop my own personal framework for that. And it really uh, involves five, what I like, because I'm a Navy guy, what I like to call anchors, leadership anchors. But you can call them leadership domains, leadership pillars, whatever you want. And you can even come up with your own system. But I'm going to spend some time today telling you about my personal system. And because I told you leadership is complex, this is going to be a little complex. It's, it's not going to be fluff. It's going to be pithy, and there's going to be some detail. But I want to describe to you my own personal framework for leadership that has served me so well. It served me well in the way that it allows me to evaluate myself as a leader from time to time. It allows me to evaluate my subordinates as leaders from time to time, and of course, whenever I learn something new, and I'm always learning new things about leadership, it allows me to hang it on one of the hooks in one of those five anchors. And each of those five anchors has four very important threads that go along with it. And that's what we're going to talk about for a little bit here, and then we'll do some questions. So buckle your seatbelts. The very first anchor that I believe in is something that's very simple called leading yourself. You can't lead other people, you can't lead an organization until you lead yourself. And the four threads that go there start with character comes first. And it's the most important thing that I will talk about today, but I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time on it. Because if you don't have it, you probably don't, you know, you'll never get it. But uh, to me, it really boils down to three things. It's about humility, genuine humility, not false humility. It's about integrity always doing the difficult right thing rather than the easy wrong thing. And it's about courage, not only physical courage, but moral courage. If you, if you can put those three things together, then you will um, be starting off on the path you want to start as a leader. And I will tell you, and I know that anybody who has actually served in the military, Commandant would agree with me, I think, that a young sailor or Marine or soldier or Air Force Airman or Coast Guardsman or a Space Force person can look at a leader and tell almost immediately whether they have good character. It's something, bad character is something that's very, very difficult to hide. Good character speaks for itself. So you have to do that. That is, that is the going in position that you have to have if you want to be a good leader. You can be a leader. You can be named a leader. You can be voted a leader. You can be established as a leader without character, but you're not going to be a very good leader and you'll probably drive your organization where it shouldn't go. The second one 
and this relates very closely to what Commandant said earlier, is know your stuff. Train yourself. Uh, obviously, you know, people are going to be teaching you in classes and schools and that sort of thing, but you have to train yourself. And that means broad and deep learning. It means reading, as the Commandant mentioned. And I would, in terms of reading about leadership, there are two things that I encourage you to look for. There are actually books on leadership out there that are generally pretty good, if you can map what they're saying onto your own personal structure. But also biographies of good leaders are, are precious ways of soaking in that knowledge about how these individual leaders got their job done, because they're all very different, but they have a lot of common threads. So read a lot, um, and no, realize that knowing your stuff is not knowing only your stuff about leadership, it's knowing about your profession. And, and all that deep knowledge about leadership in your profession is going to free you up to become creative later on. And we're going to talk about that here in a few minutes. The next one is what I call commit or quit. If you're not running to work in the morning, and I don't mean literally, I mean figuratively, we were talking about that a moment ago. If you're not running to work in the morning, then you probably ought to go find another job. Uh, your organization will very quickly understand whether you are committed to what you're doing, whether you have strong belief in the kinds of things that you're doing as, an or, as a leader and as an organization. They will pick up on that very, very quickly. And committing requires belief in what you're doing, it requires determination, it requires energy, it requires your focus, and it requires your presence. We used to have an, a, 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 a commander at, at Top Gun because, you know, at Top Gun, the inmates ran the asylum. Us young people were actually running that squadron. The commander was just sort of there. We had a guy we called decide, delegate, and disappear, uh, which we didn't really appreciate very much. But you, you have to be committed and involved if you're going to be successful. And then the, the fourth thing in terms of leading yourself is what I call manage your brain. And what do I mean by that? It means uh, that, first of all, everyone is looking for you uh, when you're under stress, when you're under crisis, to, uh, as to how you handle that. So you have to be able to handle a crisis without you know, losing your cool, as it were. Colin Powell used to call it, never let him see you sweat. The other thing is to learn how to manage stress yourself. <clears throat> you know, that involves a lot of things like you know, diet, eating well, managing your relationships, and that sort of thing. But it also tra it involves training yourself to understand how important it is to not lose it uh, when uh, when things get stressful for you. Napoleon has a great quote about that, that about how if, if you're the kind of person who can be in a situation where all hell is breaking loose and everyone is losing their minds and you don't lose your mind, that's what he called genius. Um, and so one of the things we talk about in naval aviation is compartmentalizing stress. If I'm trying to land an airplane on an aircraft carrier at night on a pitching deck in bad weather, the last thing I need to be thinking about is my parents health or my financial situation or a situation at work or what have you. So we train our aviators to put those things in a little box, put them in a corner and forget about them when you're actually doing something very difficult and pull that box out only when you need to and deal with the stress then. So that's leading yourself. It's about character. It's about knowing your stuff. It's about committing to your job and what you're doing as a leader and also managing your brain. And if you can get that all done, then uh, you're on the road to being a good leader. The second anchor, sounds pretty obvious, is called leading people. Uh, obviously, if you're going to be a leader, you've got to lead people. Um, and the first sort of thread there is to build an awesome team. You have to find, you have to develop, and you have to retain as many A players as you can for your team, realizing that 20% of the people are probably going to do about 80% of the work. So you've got to find, find those, those great people and understand uh, that uh, you're going to have to sometimes get rid of the weaker people on your team. It's not a pleasant thing uh, to have to do. Uh, I learned this as a young squadron commander when uh, just by accident I found out that if I, if I was the squadron CO that, that kept bothering the detailer, the bothering the people who make assignments for department heads, they just got tired of listening to me and they would give me whatever I wanted. And I realized that I had to go find those people, and then I had to just pound the table and ask for them. But if I did that often enough, I was going to get what I wanted. And that sort of turned the light bulb on. It's like, hey, this really makes a difference. If I work very hard to get the right people on my bus, then I'm going to have to do less work inside the bus, and I can do more work outside the bus. 
And that's a very important thing for a leader to know. The other thing to understand in terms of building an awesome team is, is to understand that diversity is not just a nice word. It's not just a social phenomenon. It's something that's actually very, very important to us, and it's a powerful force multiplier. If you have people on your team, and I'm talking about diversity of all types, you name it, uh, if you have that diversity on your team, you're actually going to be better. And one of the things I love going after people when I'm out there in, in, in the hinterland and somebody goes, you know, you military people are woke. I say, I'd like for you to go talk to my son's artillery battery. Let's close the door and that 120 people. And I'd like for you to go tell them that very diverse young group of Marines, men, women from all walks of life, all over the country, tell them that they're woke and let's see if you come out of that room alive. Okay? It really, really matters, and, and you, you need to nurture it and understand it, and it will do good things for you. Uh, the second thing under um, leading people is connecting with people, um, you know, both individuals and generations. Uh, people understand, if, you, if they know that you actually care about them personally, and it's not fake care, it's real care, and obviously you have to be very careful with people's privacy, particularly in the civilian world. You can't be too nosy that sort of thing. But if you know, hey, how, how's, uh, how's your son doing? Or uh, how are your parents doing? I understand one of them was ill. Or, you know, uh, how about that truck you bought the other day? Did you get a good loan on that thing? Uh, whatever it is, as a young leader, that, uh, where you en genuinely engage your people and you connect with them, they will respond. And the opposite is true. If, you, if you're distant from them, if you, if you don't uh, deal with them as an as a engaged and involved leader, they will not run through a brick wall for you. Uh, so connecting with people is terribly, terribly important, and they are watching you as you do or do not do that. The third thing, and this is something that's one of the more powerful things that, that I will talk to you about today that I believe, and that was taught to me by, once again, General Colin Powell, is the, what I call the duality of high standards and high care. And I will never forget, I was his aide and I'm riding in the front seat of his limousine one day and we're going to Capitol Hill to testify or something like that and I'm just carrying his bag. But he goes, you know, Sandy, the essence of leading people is holding them to the highest possible standards while you take the best possible care of them. And I thought about that and I started to live it and it really is magic. If you just do one of those two things, if all you do is hold people to high standards but you don't take care of them, then they'll do what you ask them to do, but they're going to vote with their feet eventually. And if all you do is take care of them and you don't hold them to high standards, then, then they're going to go crazy on you. We have a saying in the military that morale never goes up when standards go down. And it's so true. And it's actually true with your kids when you have kids. Uh, if you hold them to high standards but you also take great care of them. And that is one of the most important things that you, in terms of leading people, can carry with you every single day. And there are a lot of different ways to take care of people. It's not just about giving them everything they want. It's about special touches. It, it, they're in, in the military in particular, there aren't an awful lot of ways we can recognize people, unlike, as I have discovered later in life, you can recognize in the civilian world people with bonuses and lots of vacation and things like that. We don't do that in the military, but there are a lot of other things you can do to recognize people, whether it's a handwritten note or a mention at quarters or something like that. It can mean an awful lot to a young person. And then last is under leading people is trust is the coin of the realm. Uh, if you are able to give your organization your vision and give them your principles and then get out of the way and trust them, then they're going to perform for you. There's an old saying that from Ernest Hemingway that if you want to trust a person, then trust them. And that's kind of sounds like it's trite, but in fact, by releasing that uh, uh, authority, if you will, to somebody to actually execute something that, where you trust them, then they will become even more trustworthy. And, but it's important that you train them, though, on those visions and principles. As a carrier stripe group commander, I spent a lot of time with my warfare commanders explaining to them, showing them what I believed about rules of engagement in the Arabian Gulf, for example. And I told them, if you shoot down an Iranian aircraft for some reason, and you can explain why you did it in the context of the rules of engagement and what I've taught you as your strike group commander, then I will back you 100%, even if technically you might have been wrong. And if the, other, if the result opposite is true, then I, cannot, I can't help you. 
So trust enables teamwork, and uh, it also enables you, if you're able to trust your team, to go outside the bus, go outside the organization, and spend time with people adjacent above and below you in terms of, of your colleagues. Okay, so that is leading people. Build an awesome team, uh, connect with your people, high standards and, and the best possible care, and then trust is the coin of the realm. The next one is, sounds kind of bureaucratic, but it's not. It's called leading organizations, which is a little different from leading people. And the first thing you have to do as a leader when you're leading an organization is to firmly establish the culture of that organization. And that, understand, that requires understanding the culture of an organization that you inherit so that you know whether it's good and it's a sustainment thing or whether you've got to turn that culture around. And I will give you an example. When I took over my deep draft, USS Cleveland, great ship with a great uh, bunch of Marines and SEALs on board, uh, I very quickly discovered in the days before I took over that the culture of the captain before me was, I, I discovered that culture as we were driving into Pearl Harbor to do the change of command. And that captain was standing right next to the conning officer. And whenever the conning officer wanted to make a, 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 a course change, he had to look at the captain and say, Captain, I want to come one degree right. And the captain would say, OK, or make it a degree and a half, or what have you. And in the first navigation brief coming out of Pearl Harbor, I told my team, don't you dare look at me for that kind of guidance. I'm going to be sitting in my captain's chair on the starboard side of the bridge, and I'm going to be watching. And if you're 10 feet right of where I want to be in the channel, but it's a safe place in the channel, I'm not going to say a single thing. But if you look at me and you ask me to, for permission to do a course change, I'm going to glare back at you and I'm not going to answer your question. You are driving this ship. It took me a month to change that culture on the ship. But the junior officers on that ship finally realized that they were driving the ship. They were learning as they went rather than having to rely strictly on me. That's an example of finding a culture that desperately needs to be changed and then being persistent enough as a leader, you're not saying it enough unless you're tired of hearing yourself say it, to change the culture of that organization. Very, very important. The second one is, is to, as leading organizations, is, is to think strategically. It's very often an issue when a leader can only think within you know, four or five inches of his or her face. You have to always, you are perhaps the only person in the organization that can take the long view and try to find the governing principles that will drive your organization to uh, some kind of success. And there are a lot of different structures for those strategic thinking uh, uh, exercises. For example, you can turn in, in terms of national strategy, you can think of the balance between ends, ways, means, and the security environment. And when one of those variables changes, the others have to adjust, or you fall out of balance and you put the nation at risk. That's one nice way of putting it. There are many other ways of thinking strategically that you can adapt to your organization, but you really need to be the person who's doing it. And in the process of thinking strategically, you have to challenge the assumptions. And I'm going to say this later on, but you have to challenge every single assumption that's out there. More on that in a moment. The third thing you need to do in leading organizations is understanding power. How does power work? It sounds like an ugly word. But leaders exercise power, and they do it in a lot of different ways. They can do it with position power. Hey, I am the captain, and I am in charge here, so you must do what I say. They can be reward power. Hey, if you do what I ask you to do, I'm going to reward you with something. Um, it can be coercion power. If you don't do what I say, then I'm going to punish you. It can be expert power. Hey, I'm the smartest person in the room, so you should do what I suggest. It can be referent power, which is the charisma we talked about earlier. Uh, or it can be persuasion power, somebody who's just a very good orator who's going to persuade a group. Whatever type of power uh, you need to exercise in a given moment is the power you should use. So you need to learn about how power works and how it's exercised, not as a negative thing, but as a positive thing. And then the last thing under leading organizations is communicate. Okay. And there are a lot of different ways that leaders have to communicate. One is through written uh, communications. Another is through speaking to a group of people, uh, whether it's uh, in front of a platoon or whether it's at quarters or whether you're talking on the 1MC on an aircraft carrier or whatever it is, uh, you've got to be able to communicate well. And um, the, uh, the, to me, I always, when I'm, especially in a formal context, thinking about communicating, whether it's 
uh, writing something or uh, trying to influence a group of some sort, I'm always trying to think in terms of who is the audience, what is the message, who is my preferred messenger, is it me or somebody else, what is the medium that I want to use, uh, what is the timing, uh, and, um, and then, um, as I mentioned, the audience, audiences, messengers, mediums, uh, and message, and timing, and then the, the feedback mechanism that you need as a leader when you're, when you're sending those messages out. And if you can get those things right the, uh, and, and think in those terms, then you'll probably be a fairly effective communicator. And it really matters. I remember as the commander of NORTHCOM, I was trying to restore our relationship with the military of Mexico. And that military-to-military -military relationship had fallen into very bad disrepair. And so I was uh, thinking of writing an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or Washington Post or something, and I had it all written that was sort of complementary of the Mexican Marines and how, and, and Navy and, uh, and the Mexican Army, and how we needed to work together to, to counter drug lords and that sort of thing. But senior U.S. officials kept saying things that were deeply offensive to the Mexicans. And they didn't mean it to be deeply offensive, but they just didn't understand how the Mexicans were thinking of what they would say. So one day, somebody says some really terrible thing, and I decided to put the um, op-ed I was thinking about writing on my blog as the NORTHCOM commander. And I knew I had 30,000 followers on that blog, but I didn't realize that 20,000 of them were in Mexico. And the next morning, top of the fold in the Mexican newspapers uh, was this, hey, this guy gets it. Uh, he actually believes in us. He, he, he's giving us a little bit of face here. And it was a real lesson for me in the power of, of that, what is the message, what is the messenger, what is the medium, what is the timing, what is the audience? So be thinking of that. And, and learning to communicate well, learning to write well, learning to speak well takes a lot of work. As I was describing earlier outside the room, <clears throat> the, where I learned my whatever speaking skills I have, I learned at Top Gun. Because as an instructor at Top Gun, not only did you fly as an instructor pilot, not only did you have to keep things safe, not only did you have to talk about weapon systems and, and debriefs and that sort of thing, we had to give classes. And in our uh, culture at Top Gun, you had, before you could give an hour-long lecture to the class, you had to give it to the instructors. And the instructors would critique you for six to eight hours after you gave that lecture to them. They were so intent on quality communications from the instructors. And that's that kind of discipline. And another really good way to, to learn about how well you're communicating is to video yourself or have somebody video while you're giving a talk. And you will look and you'll be appalled the first time you do it. Man, I said um an awful lot. Uh, mm, that's really bad. And you can start to teach yourself the habits of a good speaker, of expressing yourself, of eye contact, of getting rid of the word um. By the way, I was talking to somebody, the, the best way to get rid of the word um is to train yourself to pause when you're thinking of saying um. And the exact opposite of um happens. People go, wow, what's he going to say next? Uh, it must be something really important, rather than this sort of insecure sounding um. And I promise to try not to say um very much during this discussion. But uh, anyway, learning to communicate is terribly important. So leading organizations, you've got to establish culture. You've got to think strategically. You've got to understand power. And then you've got to communicate extremely well. Now, the, the last two are kind of sort of my favorites. One is, the first one is leading execution. As leaders, you've got to have an organization working for you, and you have to get things done. And so getting things done is a very important aspect of being a leader. And the first thread there is to decide. Uh, it's unbelievable how many organizations that I've experienced in my life, whether they're military organizations, certainly at high levels of bureaucracy in the military, but also civilian organizations that just have a very hard time deciding. Going right back to General Colin Powell, he said, you know, once you have about 60% of the information you think you need to have in order to make a decision, it's time to decide. Because you're not going to get much more and time's wasting, and you need to get this decision out. So learn how to get things done in, in, in deciding. Another one is driving excellence. As personally as the leader, driving excellence. And it doesn't hurt to have a set of principles that assist you in driving excellence. And the one that resonates the most with me that I learned during my career is the one that was taught to me by the Navy Nuclear Propulsion Program, which I had to go through after 15 years out of, of college. I had to go through this very difficult program but it's actually an amazing way of, of looking at exe quality execution. 
they have six principles. The first one is integrity. We have to know that the people operating these machines have integrity because we can't spend a lot of time chasing down mistakes. People have to own up to them and admit them. Integrity. Level of knowledge. We want you to know more about the machine than you think you need to know because you're going to be a better operator if you do. Procedural compliance. There are procedures that are written in blood, and we don't want you to have to repeat that bloody situation. And there's too much at risk, particularly in a nuclear power plant, but also in other aspects of what we do. And then there's forceful backup, where we will never do a critical operation unless we have somebody standing behind who is not involved in that operation, who's senior, who's experienced, who can sense whether something is going wrong. And then we have formal communications or a formal environment. You may be uh, operating a nuclear power plant with your very best friend next to you, somebody you go party with and have a great time with, but you are going to establish an air of formality while you're operating that plant that dismisses that friendship, and it is now a very sort of uh, formal back and forth in terms of or giving orders and repeating orders back and that sort of thing. And then finally is a questioning attitude. We don't train our people to go walking through a propulsion plant, taking logs and looking at a gauge and noting, well, gee, the oil pressure is going up here, without asking why is the oil pressure going up. Seems very simple. And if you take those six principles, and you can have your own principles, and you apply them not just to nuclear power plants, but I apply them on flight decks, on bridges, on underway replenishment stations. My son applied them in his artillery battery to great effect, very much eliminating uh, un, you know, very costly mistakes, that sort of thing. Having that principled approach to execution can really take you a long way. The third thing under leading execution is to embrace risk and adversity. Uh, you have to understand how to do risk management, identify the risk, put mitigations in place for that risk, and then look at the residual risk and see if that residual risk is acceptable. Our special operations forces have a great way of looking at risk. They talk about risk to mission and risk to force. And if they start, you know, and the risk to mission would be, I'm going to go rescue a hostage. What is the threat to that hostage uh, if I go in there and execute this operation? What else could go wrong? What are all the risks associated with that? And then, of course, risk to forces. What is the risk to our own people? And if they establish that risk in, in, in advance, they put mitigations in place, they look at the residual risk, and then they decide whether to conduct the operation. And I can't tell you how many times I actually briefed the president on that particular framework of managing risk when we wanted to capture a terrorist or rescue a hostage. It works. So know how to manage risk. And then embrace adversity. I'll, I'll tell you another anecdote as a squadron CO. Um, I was... Uh, told at one point during my evolution here that, that they were going to take all of our money away and we weren't going to be able to fly for a quarter except for very, very few flights. And I was told directly by a three-star admiral, show the pain. They wanted me to show how bad this, this decision was, that we were going to lose our money for a while because the government couldn't get, it, get its budget act together. And I, I said to myself, you know, my job is not to show pain. My job is to take the money the taxpayers give me and create the very best fighter squadron I can possibly create. So we did all kinds of things that are, were different. We used the simulators in the middle of the night. We took our airplanes apart and put them back together. We visited museums. We did training. We did all kinds of things. And the goal was to be a better fighter squadron when we ended that three months than when we started. And we flew a 50 sortie day dropping live ordnance the week after we got our airplanes back. And people thought we were crazy, but we did it. And I almost felt like calling the three-star back and saying, you know, every squadron should have their money taken away, but nobody wanted that, right? But the point being that, that I did not want to trash my squadron's morale by saying, by transmitting that message to them, this sucks, let's show the pain. I wanted to transmit the message, this sucks, and we're going to make the best out of it that we possibly can, and we're going to turn a negative into a positive. You can do that. Finally, you want to make sure that as you're leading execution that you're measuring wisely. A lot of people gravitate towards metrics without really thinking about the metrics. And I can give you countless examples of how that has induced negative behavior in organizations. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that today, but think very, very carefully about the metrics you use and understand the difference between an input metric and an output metric and a quantitative metric and a qualitative metric. And the killer metric is a meaningful, quantitative output metric. But that's very hard to achieve. You can also have a metric that's a, that is an input metric in one way and an output metric in another. For example, let's talk about an air campaign. We've got some Air Force cadets in here probably, and naval, future naval aviators. 
and Marine Corps aviators. Uh, in an air campaign, you're thinking, oh, well, my metric ought to be sortie completion rate. Okay, well, so what, right? Sortie completion rate is actually a pretty good out me output metric for your maintenance effort, but it's not an output metric for a campaign. The output metric for a campaign is what is the effect I'm having on the enemy. So you've got to try to find ways to, if you can, quantify that, and if you can't, put it in terms that people can understand. So that's leading execution. Decide, drive excellence into your organization, embrace risk and adversity, and measure wisely. Okay, the last anchor. Anybody got any idea what it is? Leading change, which is my favorite, other than leading people. Uh, and the first element of leading change is that you, as I mentioned earlier, you have to challenge all of the assumptions. Um, change most often only occurs in a crisis, but if a leader is able to challenge the assumptions successfully and drive the organization towards a new idea, then you can do it without that crisis happening. And one of my favorite sayings is that, and I've found this many times in my career, incredibly bright people will work unbelievably long hours perfecting fundamentally flawed concepts. Okay, so if you can challenge all the assumptions and get that fundamental flaw exposed, maybe you can get your incredibly bright adults to work incredibly long hours make, doing something that will make a positive difference. The second one is lead the creative process. You may or may not uh, be a terribly creative person yourself, but you can lead a creative process. You find that most of the great ideas that have happened in the last several centuries have happened either because of a single polymath somebody who did lifelong learning horizontally and vertically and understood their profession and everything around it so well that they were able to come up with a new idea, or it was somebody who put together a small but diverse and intelligent team to attack a problem and attack that problem successfully. One way or the other, that creative process has to occur, and you as the leader need to set the conditions for it to occur, whether it's you actually personally leading it or you setting the conditions. The fourth one, is overcoming resistance. And believe me, as you get more senior in any organization, including the military, you're gonna to have to get very good at overcoming resistance. And so I try to uh, think of resistance, particularly bureaucratic resistance, in terms of concentric circles. The first, when I'm trying to change an organization, inject something new into an organization, the first and innermost circle is ignorance which is not stupidity. It just means somebody doesn't understand the idea yet, and I need to teach them. So that's the ignorance circle, and you want to get through that quickly. The next circle is denial. Hey, this idea is going to cause me to have to do more work. And by the way, you're only doing it because you want a better fitness report. You want to make yourself famous. And, you know, it ain't broke. Why fix it? So that's the sort of denial um, uh, circle, and you try to get people through that. And then there's something called vicious compliance. Okay, I realize I got to do this. Uh, I don't really want to do this, but I got to do it, and I'm going to show you how messed up this idea is. And so they do that. And then eventually, people might, if they had to go through those two circles, hopefully they skip those two bad circles, they get into the sort of well intended misapplication circle where, hey, they're embracing the new idea, but they don't completely understand it, making a few mistakes, that sort of thing. And then, and then the last circle is when people have, understand it, they are champions for it, and it's well embedded in the body of practice. Now, the reason I say this is because when I'm talking to somebody in an organization where I'm trying to inject a new idea, I want to know what circle that person's in because I'm going to talk to them differently depending on what circle they're in. If they're in the ignorant circle, I'm going to be a patient teacher. If they're in the denial or, well, or uh, vicious compliance circle, we may have a short and exciting conversation. If they're in the well-intended misapplication circle, it's a patient retraining and nurturing and, hey, you know, you're getting it, let's, let's do this. And then finally, when they're in that outer circle, the one I want everybody to be in, then, then it's a, a uh, reward circle. It's a, ward, a reward conversation. So understand how people resist change. And there are a lot of really cool bureaucratic techniques uh, that if you ever get to the Pentagon to a senior leadership position, come see me and I will give you a few of those techniques. Um, the last thread under the uh, anchor of leading change is what I call sail upwind, sailing upwind. It's the title of my book. And when you think about those of you who might have sailed a sailboat before, I know a lot of Naval Academy midshipmen in here have probably had to do that as a plebe. Uh, you are actually doing something that's kind of counterintuitive. 
you are taking a machine and pushing it against a prevailing force field called the wind. And how on earth does that work where you can actually sail upwind? Well, there, you have to understand the techniques, the leadership techniques that get you to that position, figuratively, and you have to be bold. You have to be willing to take a chance, personally, in leading an organization through change. Because you know you might just be wrong. It might be that the prevailing conditions change in the middle of what you're trying to do. And you might be embarrassed. But if you don't have the guts and the willingness to take personal risk, to be bold, and lay it on the line and make that change happen, then you probably don't belong in a situation where you should be leading change. So be bold. So that's the five leadership pillars that, that I have used throughout my life and that I continue to add to. It's leading, it's leading yourself, it's leading people, leading organizations, leading execution, and leading change. And if you can go on this lifelong journey of learning and try to fill out those things as best you can at every step of the way, I can just about guarantee you that you will be an effective leader that people will look up to and that you will have an enriching leadership experience as you go through your life and your career. Now, what I'd like to do in the remaining time, and I think we have a few minutes, I would love to take some of your questions. So who's going to be first? Hey, sir. Cadet Rainey, the United States Military Academy. When you talk about building and keeping an awesome team, how do you do that when people are on the verge of leaving the organization? Because we see that with our firsties or with people who are on sports teams who identify themselves with a different organization or a different team. So whenever we're on the border of graduating, how do you keep people staying on the team that they're on? So I want to make sure I understand the question. There's a natural flow through in any organization, particularly the service academies. Every year, quarter year, people leave. Uh, are you asking how do you, reta how do you retain the culture after those people are gone? Uh, no, sir. I'm, how do you keep people who are about to leave as still staying within the organization and not just fading away? Oh, you, so is, the, is then the question, as they get closer to leaving, they start to drop the pack? Yes, sir. Well, it's unfortunate that that happens. And I think uh, a, a good leadership team will recognize that and will say, let's run through the tape here. Let's run through the finish line. Uh, people are watching you. Uh, and that's one of the most important things to understand as a young leader is that people are watching you very closely as a leader. You almost have to wake up every morning and remind yourself, you know, my young sailors, my young Marines, my young soldiers are going to be, are, are watching me. And I have to exhibit the kinds of behaviors that are going to motivate them uh, and, and, and by the way, I'm going to build the good habit patterns in myself that cause me to be a good leader in that next place that I go. So if you're the kind of leader who's going to drop the pack your last three months uh, in a service academy, what kind of leader are you going to be towards the end of your platoon leader tour or towards the end of your squadron tour? Probably the same thing. We don't need that. We don't want that. And you're not going to be successful. Your, your leadership will recognize that you're doing that. You kind of get a freebie leaving a service academy. You don't get the freebie after that. Sir. Good morning, sir. Thank you for your time. I'm currently a sophomore at Siena College. Um, during your speech, you mentioned committing or quitting. Um, as both a student and an athlete, sometimes I struggle with main maintaining consistency, especially, ones, especially when no one's looking. So I was wondering if you could tell us some ways or strategies that you yourself have maintained consistently. consistency. Sorry. And so you mean um, maintaining my commitment to the organization in exactly. spite of the... Yeah, it, it's... Uh, the part, the part of committing as a leader is, is believing in what it is you're doing uh, and, and summoning the energy to, to do it with enthusiasm, energy, focus, and the like. And sometimes it, it, it's useful to go away for a few days and, and uh, kind of purge yourself of everything and, and reflect on, on where you are on this journey that you're doing. And, you know, it, it's amazing how maybe in the middle of the night or while you're going for a run or what have you, ideas will pop back into your head that will re-energize you uh, towards what it is you're trying to accomplish, whether it's as a leader or an athlete or what have you. I think it's important. It's the best ideas I've ever had in my life have, had, have come when I've been running. You know, mine just starts working, right? So I think one technique you might consider is, is don't, don't just grind away. Get away for a day or two or a week or whatever it takes and use that time 
not only to relax and blow off a little steam, but, but also to, to contemplate uh, what's coming next. I think you'll find that it's valuable time. Thank you. Sir. Uh, hello, sir. I'm from Polish Naval Academy. I'm a midshipman, Marcel Stoczewski. I wanted to ask you about how to make a good first impression when it comes to your, uh, as a future young leader and how to create a line um, not to be, to be still for, formal and not to be uh, friends with your uh, subordinates. Okay. So the question, to repeat it, was uh, what about being a new leader? W what can you do in order to get off to a good start, basically? And I, I think the most important thing for an, an, a new leader to do is to make sure that, going back to what Colin Powell told me, is that you are the kind of leader who is going to do those two things. And what are those two things? High standards and care. And you don't have to be a martinet. You don't have to be stiff and formal and yelling and screaming in order to get that across. You just make it very clear. There's a standard here. I'm going to uphold it, but I'm also going to take care of you. I'm going to look after you. I'm going to eat last. I'm going to make sure that your barracks are, or wherever your living conditions are appropriate. Uh, I'm going to make sure you have what you need in order to succeed but I'm going to hold you to a high standard. I think that you can do that very quickly as a leader, particularly if you inherit an organization where that's not being done. You can reset that standard very quickly. Uh, if it's already being done, then you need to make sure people understand that you are going to sustain that. And I, I, I wasn't quite sure I understood the last part of your question, but you were talking about being friends with the people you're you leading. You have to cross the line. Yeah, you have to be very careful with that. And, and one of the things that's very difficult for young, young leaders who are promoted inside an organization, it, there can be great discomfort there. Hey, I'm a bubba with my guys, man. I'm, I'm just another pilot, you know, J.O., whatever. And all of a sudden, I get bumped up into a, a, a job with higher responsibility. You can, you can still be friends with the people uh, that, that uh, you, know, you used to be close peers with, but you have to establish that line. You have to take that leap of faith that they promoted me for a reason, they have expectations of me, and that there is something that has changed here. And that's very difficult for young people to do, but you have to do it. And you can do it without being a you know what, but, um, but you have to do it, you have to draw that line. So, okay. Thank you, sir. Sir. Good morning, sir. Uh, Midshipman Fourth Class Lazarus, I'm from the George Washington University Navy ROTC unit. I just wanted to ask about, you talked about changing culture as a leader when you get into positions and uh, like when you're captain of that ship. Uh, I wanted to ask, how do you discern something from your, from your opportunities throughout your career? What is a bad culture versus not your style? And when should you keep aspects of the culture that you're generally unfamiliar with, but you see that maybe work in the, the existing culture of the, whatever organization you become a leader of? Yeah. So the first thing I'll say about culture is, um, very often, people believe that their culture is the vision that they're, the principles that they've put on the wall. And I had this experience as, as a board member of a major corporation where I asked the CEO, so what, what is our culture? He goes, those five things on the wall. And I told him that every organization has five things on the wall, but not every organization has good culture. It's about how you live and breathe those things and whether you're repeating them and whether you're debriefing in the context of those cultural values. Um, and so uh, that's one important point is to, is to know what the culture is. And then the, the signs of, of bad culture can be pretty obvious. If you see people acting without integrity, if you see people hiding their mistakes, if you see people um, who are dismissing each other out of hand without listening, uh, those sorts of things. All of the things, and, and one of the great things about sensing bad culture is that everybody can do it. A, a sailor can walk aboard a ship and tell pretty quickly if the culture is good or not. I can walk aboard a ship that's getting underway out of Norfolk or San Diego, and after about 10 or 15 minutes on the bridge, I can tell you whether the ship has a good culture or not. Uh, it, it's, it's just that sensory mechanism. But under, having, having you know, a framework of principles, leadership principles, as I've described, kind of gives you the tools to detect that. So learn as much as you can about organizations, and you'll very quickly be able to tell, discern good culture from bad culture. But Thank there you, are sir. definitely signs out there. Uh, over here, ma'am. 
Good morning. Uh, my name is Remington Shaw. I'm from Loyola University, Maryland. Um, and my question for you this morning is how do you think the best way or what do you think the best way is to deal with imposter syndrome as young people, especially as leaders? I think there's um, a lot of that fear in today's day and age of just like I'm not, I don't deserve where I'm at. And how do you think the best way to deal with that is? <laughs> That's a great question. I love it. Imposter syndrome. Everybody knows what it is, right? Uh, hey, I don't really belong here. I, somehow I got my naval aviator wings and I'm now in a squadron. I, uh, you know, I'm not so sure. Or I'm leading, a, 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 put into a, a, a position of leadership that maybe I'm not so sure about. I, I think um, if there's anybody on the planet who's never felt that, uh, I'd like to know who they are, uh, for one thing. I, I, I do believe, though, that um, uh, the, the notion, and I think Commandant was talking about this, of lifelong learning, of, of getting in the organization, digging in, uh, and learning as much as you can. And I used to tell my junior officers this in my fire squad, and I'd say, look, you can go to the gym for two, two hours a day, and you'll be a beast. Uh, or you can go to the gym for an hour a day and still be a beast, and spend that other hour a day learning something about your profession. And um, if you do that, the rich get richer very, very fast. It's unbelievable how just that extra hour of day, a day learning about your profession and then being bold enough to go, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna flex my muscles here a little bit. I'm actually going to take this leap of faith. I've been trained well, I have a great attitude, I've been teaching myself, and I'm going to make some noise. And, you know, and I know this is very difficult for women. Sometimes women are dismissed in an organization when they shouldn't be. Uh, too bad for the organization, as far as I'm concerned. Step out and, and do it. Uh, I, I think it's just that sort of that leap of faith. Get out there and believe in yourself. Just do it, okay? And Thank you so much. kill that stress. Compartmentalize it. Sir. Morning, sir. My name is Jaleel Ahmed Litz. I'm a freshman at Christopher Newport University. Okay. You talked about um, you know, managing stress, managing your brain. What is a time that taught you to manage your brain? Like a time that you were like, oh, this is a little overwhelming, having experienced this before. Um, really, probably, probably a lot of times in my career. Uh, I mentioned the one time when I, my money was taken away, and I was like, well, what do I do now? That This is stressful. I've got an organization to lead here. But, you know, just think your way through it. Um, <clears throat> there are other, other times, captain of USS Enterprise, when 911 happened, and I'm, it, it, as you can imagine, we were like exiting the Strait of Formos on Enterprise on our way home from a very successful deployment. My safety officer says, turn on the TV, captain, something's going on in New York. And I see the first building is on fire. There's commentary on the news, like, we don't really know what's happened here. Is this a terrorist act or some little private plane flew in? And then I saw at that moment the second plane hit the second tower. That was a stressful moment for everybody. What are we going to have to do? Are we going home? Are we going to stay here? Are we going to be in combat tomorrow? What do we do to, to handle that? And it was really a matter uh, in a situation like that. And people who have been under fire, and I've been under fire in, in an airplane before, will tell you, you just kind of have to put everything aside. And you go, okay, I got a few things I got to do right now. Uh, I've got to, or if you have an aircraft emergency, I can't stress out about this aircraft emergency. I just got to, got to think through what I've been trained to do. Um, and I, I think reverting back to, to your, your most cherished principles and reverting back to your training and reverting back to your self-learning is the most powerful way to get through a stressful situation. You know, get control of your mind and do the things you have to do. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you, sir. Okay. Sir. Good morning, sir. Mitch, I'm third class Redmond. Thank you for being our first speaker of the week. Uh, over the course of this conference, we'll be receiving a lot of advice and information. How would you suggest um, that we remember that information and how do we apply it to our own lives? Really good question. How do, how do you absorb the massive amount of information you're going to get this week. <clears throat> and, and that's kind of a microcosm of, of lifelong learning itself. And I think it's really, I tried to do this uh, at more and more as I was growing up in, in you know, my career, was to try to have a way of organizing my brain, as it were, and, and to be able to, to bin things. And I was taught this by my high school English teacher, by the way. She said, hey, if you're write, trying to write a paper, and you're writing it the night before it's due, you're probably not going to do very well. But, you know, if it's not due in two weeks, just carry a piece of paper around in your pocket. And whenever you think of something, just write it down on that piece of paper. 
And then, when it's time to write the paper, grab all these little pieces of, of paper together and come up with a framework for um, what you're going to say. That was, and, and that is sort of an analogy for what you're talking about, is, is, is find a way to organize the information that you're absorbing. And with, with a computer, you can do it very easily. And I was, I was talking earlier, I, <clears throat> what, one of the things that I try to do is organize the things that I'm involved with into lists that I memorize. So obviously I have a list of five leadership anchors memorized, right? We just went through them. I have a list of six things you have to do for cybersecurity. I have a list of five national security um, imperatives that we, that, that, you know, and so if somebody asks me to talk, I can just rattle those things off and extemporaneously do that. It's not because I'm a particularly smart person, it's just because I organized my brain in a particular way where I can, can, can uh, organize the information that I'm absor absorbing. Now, one thing as a, as a thought experiment you could do is as you learn over the next couple of days things about leadership, see if they fit in the five anchors or any of the four threads in those five anchors if you happen to write them down. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Maybe you'll think of a new anchor or a new thread that I have missed. I'd like to hear about it if you have because I want to learn myself. So being organized, I think, is, is one of the most important things you can do. Being able to lay your hands on anything that you've, you've learned uh, that's important to you that you might apply in a future setting is really important and useful. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Perfect. If there's a break, I'll see people out in the... Okay. Good morning, sir. My name is Irene Thornton. I'm from Christopher Newport University. At the very beginning, you mentioned this idea that leadership is not a soundbite, but I'm really curious how you might go about using one or more of your anchors to sort of combat this idea, specifically when so many people nowadays have, A, such a short attention span, but also when the media is so specifically going out of their way to make soundbites of and for our leaders. So you're trying to trap me into giving you a soundbite? <laughs> Only if you offer to. <clears throat> okay. Uh, if I were to, I, I would, it would turn into a list, right, that I just gave you? And, of course, my first list would be the five anchors. But I told you at the beginning that the most important thing is character. You can't do anything without character. And we're faced with this every day in this, in this country about, you know, a crisis of character. So I would say character, competence, and caring are probably the three C's that, that I would take away if you forced me into a sand, sound bite. Thank okay? you, sir. And, and the competence comes from lifelong learning and study and work. The character comes from yourself. And then the caring is your, your empathy, your, your emotional IQ, that sort of thing. Thank you. Okay. All right. I hope you have a really great conference. I, I'm really excited that it's grown the way it has, as I mentioned. This is a fantastic, I think it's well worth your time. And I found that whenever I was in a conference or a setting like this, that it was just valuable to sit there with a piece of paper in front of me and jot down ideas and then collect those ideas when I got back to where I was from and put them into execution. So I hope you have ample opportunities over the next couple of days to do that. Thanks to the organizers and thanks to the Commandant for hosting. But thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jordan Corpus. I'm the Curriculum Officer for the Naval Academy Leadership Conferences here. We're now going to transition to our first breakout session. So if you guys look down at your name tags, you'll see at the bottom a table number. We're going to dismiss you guys in groups of five. There's 34 total breakout sessions, and our moderators are going to be ready to receive you guys out in the, the hand lobby. Starting on my left side, we'll have breakout group one. We'll be on the stairs, two, somewhere in the middle, three, right around the center doors, four, and then five on the opposite stairs. So if you look down at your name tag, you're one through five, please stand up now, head to the lobby. Please try not to use the restroom right now, especially because it's the first one we want.